Welcome back, Discover listeners, to the I Want to Travel podcast. This is Susanna, and today is episode number eight. I am very excited to introduce to you Calvin Sun. He is um, what I think a fascinating person, and you'll hear why. And I'm sure if you haven't seen him, you will see him um, a lot um, because he has been um, an amazing um, well, ER doctor in New York City in March during the craziness of the beginning of uh, the pandemic in the US. And throughout the year, he's worked really, really hard to try to keep our um, uh, country <laughs> uh, safe and back to normal, at least some of some of, of uh, New York, right? Or all of New York. So um, say, uh, Calvin, say hello to the Discoverless community and tell us what's your favorite destination and a hot spot that you recommend there. Hello, everybody. Good to be here and be back in touch. Um, I've been down for years now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> first time meeting at a, at a bar in 79th Street and 3rd, I remember. Like three to four years ago. You have such um, a great memory. I was trying to think. I'm like, I know we met because of Monsoon Diaries and Discover List, but what is it exactly the, you know, when, how we met and you, I, I couldn't remember. <laughs> oh, you know, it's, we have so many memories, but there are things, I always like to remember the first time we meet anyone. Uh, uh-huh. And that's, that's actually my answer to you. And that in travel memories, it's uh, a trip is best measured in friends, not miles. Yes. So, oh, uh, what better way than to, when you recall when you first met someone that you've kept in touch with all this time, as a travel memory? And that's that's what you know. It's it's all about you know how it, the story begins. Absolutely. And so um, so yeah, tell us about uh, your favorite. You've been to a ton of countries. Tell us what's your favorite travel destination and a hot spot there. Oh yeah, I mean I don't I don't choose favorites among children or parents <laughs> or family members. It, everyone or 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 former relationships they're all special in all different ways uh, I have a list of superlatives that i can give to you uh most fascinating would be north korea myanmar and turkmenistan the most beautiful uh, nature wise is antarctica namibia and greenland far uh, most wow. magical is new zealand the country that I keep going back to over and over when i try not to go to the same place twice is india but i would now pick that to south asia so because i've been to pakistan multiple times as well nice. most underrated is slovenia armenia uh most fun will be cuba and ukraine the best food will be iran spain and japan uh the most convenient easily travel wise like like that i didn't even have to stress too much is japan and the most surprising is uh iraq northern iraq kurdistan especially I love it. Like I would, we have to do so many podcasts with you so we can talk about all those specific experiences. <laughs> I mean, that? I can even go to like specific travel moments and then every one of them has a story on why they deserve superlative. I am sure. And you know, I, I do remember, what I do remember is one of our first conversations was about your trip to North Korea and your story there. That is crazy so i do remember that <laughs> yeah, um, but we'll have to keep we'll have to leave that for another podcast because we'll be here all day just talking about your travel experiences <laughs> but what i really wanted to talk to you today and i've been as you know i've been trying to get you on my podcast but uh you've been busy very very busy and understandably so but i first wanted you to tell us about monsoon diaries um, so like we mentioned, we've met through you and Monsoon Diaries and myself on Discover List and our mutual love for travel. So tell us a little bit about your group and uh, what you do and uh, how has it been going? Because I know we can't really travel right now. So how, what have you been doing with them? So the Monsoon Diaries has taken many different forms over the last 10 years since it started. I would say the best way to describe it, uh, show don't tell wise, is that scene in Forrest Gump where he starts running around the country by himself after Jenny leaves him for like the 10th time. And he's running alone. That's me traveling alone after I lost a bet to a girl at a bar. Uh, and that was my first time traveling. 36 hours later, I was something like that when I was like in Egypt with her. Like, Who are you? Um, started running alone. So I traveled alone. And then after in the, you know, after a few years of him running around the country to one coast and other coast, and he just didn't have a plan. He was just like, I started running toward the end of the lawn. And it's that once I got to the lawn, I said I'd run to the end of the city. And once I got to the end of the city, I decided to run to the end of the state lines. Once I got to the end of the state lines, I started to just keep running. And that's essentially what I did, never really planning on anything. And after a few years of just him doing it by himself, just because he's doing it for himself, authentically, genuinely, other people start following along. And they're like, you get, you're a man that seems to have it all figured out. 
And like, I would watch that scene. I was like, yeah, I remember that happening. People would just show up in my trips. And it's like, I read your, been reading a blog and you look like, you look like someone that has it all figured out. And I'm like, no, I don't. And who are you? And, okay. He is right. Like, you do have it all figured out. Like you do I a don't. million and one things. Plus you have like a 10 pack. I'm like, how does he do all of this stuff? And still have time to do this, all these workouts. <laughs> oh my God. No, none of this plan. I don't really, I, do I look like a man that, you know, knows what he's doing five minutes from now? <laughs> Actually, that, honest truth is I don't. I just make sure I get like, enough sleep every night like that's like the most important at night like eat healthy or something but even that's difficult but I don't really plan anything I just do what it feels right I commit to the present uh, I always tell people stop thinking so much about what you should be or the future because you're then yes. missing all the things that can be going in the moment and then 10 years later I mean well it will happen moving for a scum he like a few years later running around he turns around and it's like hundreds of people following uh and running behind him and he it's not like he wants the group it's not like he wanted to set out to create a group you just tell them to go home, um, which I tried to do many times in the beginning. I was like, yeah, go home. Like, I don't want you to come with me. Do you know, like, I love traveling alone. Like, you, you should, you know, grateful. I said, okay, you know, I was such a jerk. It just wouldn't leave. <laughs> and then over time, I was like, you know what? It's kind of nice to have someone hold your camera and to take a photo instead of like, you know, trying to talk to other people. Sometimes it's nice to like, you know, have someone wait in line for you for the bus tickets while you have to run, you can run to the bathroom and then have someone else grab a food for the group. You know, and then, you know, splitting a cab four ways is so, so much cheaper than traveling alone and spending a cab by yourself. So then eventually I, you know, gave in and, and then it became this community and it formed itself. They started calling themselves Monsooners. Uh, I, I, and my friend one day was like, you know what, you should make something out of it. And then uh, he corp my friend incorporated a business for me, gave me the reins to the business. And to this day, people still like pay me to take them on, on, my, on my travels. And I'm like, what is going on? And to this day, I'm still pinching myself. Very grateful for it. Um, but ultimately, the goal is to, it's kind of like, you know, seeing a doctor or a nutritionist or, you know, whoever. Their goal is to make sure you can function on your own, to pick you up where you fall. So if it gets people to travel alone without needing me, that's the ultimate purpose. Um, and I'm very happy to see some of them, you know, traveling alone and, uh, and can say that their first time traveling was with me. But I have to say that your trips are not just like, oh, let's go chill in the uh, by the beach. Or no, your, yours are intense. And you told me too, because we talked about it. Um, you said, well, if you're going to come on a monsoon diary uh, trip, it's not your typical trip. So tell us a little bit about what that means. We do chill on trips. I mean, there's some, <laughs> definitely some moments where we just spend days doing nothing. And that's essentially it. Like, uh, the it's the irony of life is what I capture in my tra travels. And that you know, there's like a quote that says, we travel to find everything fascinating, what we at home find mundane, and like the everyday things. Oh my God, a cafe, you know? Nice. Yes. Um, there are cafes in New York too, and in that <laughs> home. Right? There's nothing special about more, but it's like, oh my God, a croissant. Like we have croissants too. But people find that fascinating. And it's just like the same thing. It's like, it's just real life. Like just that, that's the irony. And what we do in, in, in for my, my trips is that I don't plan really anything. I mean, I plan everything out to the T in terms of like, you know, the flights and the buses and the trains so that we are, we have something to plan, but I also plan the unplannable, the chaos, the times where we don't, you know, have anything planned. We will see everything in the city. We will see, you know, if, if you're visiting New York, I was like, we will obviously get to see all the must see things like Central Park or Times Square or Rockefeller's, but that's not the goal. Like I, I the, the, how we're going to see it, that is left up to the group. Um, there is a certain loose plan that I sometimes have, but we don't have to necessarily follow it. There are plenty, countless times where it's even on my, my, my website, uh, monsterdives.com slash friends, where you see countless stories that's spanning like seven to 10 pages, hundreds of people where we have stories per person, where we just meet people in the middle of our itineraries and completely take a diversion detour where it has nothing to do with the original trip, where we end up somewhere else because of that person, because a trip is best measured in friends, not miles. And I list all these stories with their photos uh, to know that we can look back one day and not have to forget what happened in that amazing story, because it's, at the end of the day, it's not about what you see, but how you travel. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it is a lot of free time, which you get to do your own thing, have the freedom to actually say, you know what? You can even tell me, like, I don't like you. And I don't like traveling with you. I, I need something more or whatever. And you can split off on me. And I'm like, okay, you signed a waiver. Uh, you know, <laughs> just show up at the bus station before we go into the next city or don't show up at all or meet me in this city if you want to do that. Like that is nothing, no one's holding your hand. This is your trip. I just make sure I do, all, you know, I just do all the things you, some people just don't like doing, which is planning. 
Um, if you choose not to show up again or you fall in love and want to stay behind, which has happened, I'll let oh. that happen. <laughs> so it's, it is your trip. And, you know, obviously I travel the way I want to and it's up to you if you want to follow on. I will see everything when I arrive to a place um, because I'm very thorough, but I also will leave a lot of room for freedom. So it's not like a giant like, follow my flag kind of tour, but it's more of like you create your own adventure tour and you sign up because you're traveling someone who's never been there before either. And we're all in this together. No, you're right. I, I think that um, it's good to have kind of an idea of what you're going to do. And but myself, like I, I am like that, too, where I like, OK, I'm going to go to this destination and I want to see X, Y and Z. Um, but I'm not going to plan every single second of every single day because, yeah, some things can change once you're there. You want to see something else that you didn't think about when you were planning the trip. So uh, being like flexible life. is important. What's that? Like back to life. Don't don't you know, don't focus too much on your dreams where you should be let you know commit to the present which means that it can take so many features you don't want to look back on life and like you let you see where you are it's like yeah i planned it all out that's so boring yep don't look yep. back and life and like what just happened steve Jobs is a quote that like it doesn't make sense when you try to connect with moving forward but it always makes sense when you're trying to connect with us looking back yep um and what is it there's several quotes quotes on that like life happens when you're not planning or something like that like things are not going to happen just because you planned it that way, like stuff, the world and the universe just occurs and life just happens. It doesn't matter what you plan. A lot of times it's not going to work out that way. So it's just good to live with the moment Parasite. and go with the flow. Yeah. What's that? No, no, the movie Parasite, the best plan is no plan. Exactly, okay. exactly. But I really want to talk to you about last year. Oh, has it been a year? And um, in March specifically, as you remember, I left NYC as soon as everybody was saying, or the companies were saying you can work from home. I took a, a flight back to LA ASAP. It was uh, scary times. We didn't know what was happening. I thought, what if the airport closed? Like you just don't know what's happening. And so thought, you know, what? I'm going to leave right now before that happens and I can't get out of here. So I left, but then you instead uh, was working 24 seven. You're an ER doctor in New York City and um, you were a part of the front lines and working nonstop that whole time. And um, we spoke early or messaged early around that time because I've been following you on um, Instagram and everything you've been doing. And I like I, I told you, oh, I need I, I owe you a, um, a few drinks because I want to celebrate or, or kind of uh, a little bit of what you've done. And it's been almost a year and I still owe you those drinks. You don't have to pay anything. Yeah, I know. Cool. I want to I want to uh, buy you those drinks because you deserve that and you deserve it a lot more. And I hope that you've been uh getting, you know, that recognition or that just, you know, um, people being grateful towards you for everything that you've done. But tell us a little bit about what happened in March and how did you get that called or how, how do you guys, how, how did, what happened? It's, I mean, I work per diem at the majority of the hospital system in New York. So every day I'm in a different ER. I work whenever and wherever I want, which is ironic because I remember choosing this lifestyle so that I, I can choose not to go into work. I felt like my life was <laughs> pandemic and ironically what actually happened is I ended up going more often than just full-time doctors I mean I think in the first 50 days of uh, my life with COVID I think I went into work I think at least 35 times out of the first 50 days I remember oh, wow. that one made me count it on my Apple calendar and I'm like wow I really worked more off than usual with full-time doctors they work about 10 to 12 shifts a month uh that's 10 12 a month so I think I worked three months worth in the wow. first like, you know month and a half um, you know, in the top of that with the pandemic, you know, with, it's not just like a willy nilly, you know, regular day in the emergency room. It's like an emergency room in the middle of a pandemic and the beginning of it, where you didn't know what the next day would, you know, would hold and, you know, what the next minute would be like, especially dealing with a virus that no one knew anything about, uh, without any like standardized, you know, plan of care because no one knew enough about this virus. Yeah. So like in the unknown, working more often than usual, choosing to with that autonomy that was very confusing like do i want to be here or do i need to be here then i realized like, that's what love is you know isn't that i mean isn't that what love is you you know right any sense of what um is logical or self-preservation in order you know to do something that makes no sense but it makes emotional sense to you um or it's, a, it's like a temporary form of insanity i felt like i don't want you scared and i'm like you know what yeah of course everyone was scared but like it's not about the feeling, but it's more the meaning behind the feeling or what you do with that feeling, the meaning yeah. behind action after that feeling. So fear can make me stay home, which I could have as a per diem. I could tell, tell, tell everyone, no, I made enough. 
you know, you know, to get by. So I was like, you know, I'll just save, live on my savings and set up this pandemic. But I actually went in and, you know, use that fear to create courage to that courage motivates to go in. I'm not saying I'm courageous. I'm saying that courage can't, I started thinking about it. Courage can't exist without fear. If there was no fear, then we couldn't, wouldn't call it courageous. It would just be normal. Like, right, right. And it, uh, makes, it only makes it courageous because of something that uh, precedes that, that makes it uh, risky. Yeah. Uh, so that's what I chose to reframe that fear in order to motivate me to go in because I just knew that I couldn't sit well myself with that, uh, not knowing enough. And also, I just wanted to, I always also made a, a life mission to always run towards the fire um, because my life was full of like trauma and things happening to me, uh, people dying or people like letting me down, flaking on me. And I was like, you know, that's that's uh, actually a fact of life and I have to just accept that. But rather than just letting it happen, I'd rather now actually run towards and at least uh, own it and be in control of that chaos. Hence, like how I travel, like accept that chaos happens in chaos. Travel's like a marriage. The only way to do it wrong is to think you can control it. So imagine like, why not yeah. just control the chaos, accept the just chaos, let it but, be. Control it, but at least, you know, be in control of, you know, the free days, be in control of when I can run towards the trauma. So that way I can like turn around and kick life back, at, you know, when it gets, kicks me in the ass. So that's how I saw the first few days in March where, you know, all these people coming in, not, you know, knowing what to expect, looking for a test that didn't even exist. Um, they we didn't have any symptoms. They looked well. So we just sent them home with nothing because we didn't have any tests. So we would swab them and the Department of Health hoping they knew, knew what to do, you know, handwriting things on pieces of paper uh, with their contact info, hoping the Department of Health knew, but we knew that they probably didn't know either. It was a mess, you know, and then the next week they started having symptoms, but they were still good enough to go home, but they were like, I need guidance and we didn't have any, but we tried to do our best. And then the third week they started having symptoms, but then it was already too full and people were getting sick and they were spreading to one another and you know, the hospital was, wow. you know, full, too full to admit any patients or patients stayed in the emergency room and they started dying in the emergency room and the waiting rooms. Uh, and it was just like, you know, hell on earth and unforgiving what we went through. But every week was, it was changing. We had no, nowhere to expect. And then once lockdown happened, it took three weeks for lockdown to take effect. All of a sudden they stopped showing up because people stayed at home and, you know, the virus did its damage and, you know, burns itself out because no one was going outside anymore to spread the virus. And then we had a summer where, you know, it was actually a reprieve, but we just were holding our breath. We didn't know what was going to come back anytime because this is the first time it's ever happened. Everyone asks us for predictions and what's going to happen. It's like, how am I going to predict when something that's never happened since the 1918, you know, Spanish flu before any of us were alive? Can't predict right. any prediction. So just right. do your math. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that was my March. I mean, I remember I, I was leading a co-leading a two week trip in Angola uh, up until March 7th flying back March I remember 7th. you telling me this yes and realize and it was just odd to feel like my life was safer in a developing country like Angola <laughs> than back home in New York City with the virus because I feel wow. like Angola was way more prepared than New York because everyone would have PPE in the airports in Angola they were temperature scanning everyone in Angola in March you know in not even March like you know February uh yeah. when I was there when I first went there um, they had signs about COVID. When I flew back in New York on March 8th, after two weeks in Angola, there was no evidence of COVID anywhere. You know, welcome home and no PPE, no temperature checks. It was just a free for all. And then March 8th, literally six, like, I don't know, eight hours after I landed, 10 hours after I landed from Angola, uh, I saw my first COVID patient in Brooklyn. Wow. And, you know, and, and tell me a little bit about like you, the other doctors, the nurses, I mean, the, in that profession, you're used to seeing sick people and then you care for them and you help them and you're used to seeing people die. But in, but last year was just something else. And it was like after one, after the other, what was kind of the sense between you guys and how did you guys help each other, keep each other going and tell us a little bit about that. I don't know. I don't want people to leave the podcast to like tune in and start crying like I see oh. nightmares for the rest of my life. Oh no! Uh, you, I'm I'm very I'm prefacing this. I can I can really make you cry right now. Oh, don't make me cry. Uh, so you want me to go really into it, or do you just want me to say something generic? Say whatever <laughs> you say, say whatever you think we'd want to hear, just to kind of. Uh, I know I go all in it. I warned you, trigger warning. But like it's yeah, serious. Funny. Like there are plenty of nurses and colleagues who have went through all with me. Who it's like such badasses who finally have told me and they, and, you know, pull down their mask. And it's like, for the first time in life, I'm scared. And yeah. 
and then I would never see them again because they died. Oh. Days later. So they knew, all right? It, this is no joke. I have yeah. friends that no longer, longer around. My grandfather died from COVID. I After saw that. I am so room. sorry. Uh, that just broke my heart. I uh. told him not to go to the emergency room. He went anyway, and he never came back. Uh. I had to go because I was like, you're going to catch it. You're going to get more of a viral dose. Oh, I already have it. Okay, well, just stay home because you're going to get more of it. You're going to get different variants, strains, or whatever it is. We don't know enough about this. You went in. Yeah. Do you and think? Everyone, I, and then I, my friends took care of him. And then they couldn't Where does he live? He was or in Elmhurst. Lived? Where? Elmhurst. Where's that? In New York? Queens. Oh, in Queens. Yeah, that's like the ground zero. Ground zero is a ground zero. Ground oh, zero. wow. Elmhurst. Oh, Queens. man. That, that's the that was the ground zero of New York City, which was ground zero back in March. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And it, it doesn't it make you feel like because he's so close, you you can't do anything, you know, you had what your own thing and you telling him not to go and he still went, you know, it just makes you feel a little bit kind of um, you know, like you could have you wish you could have ran to him, right? Or no. <laughs> I was too late. And yeah. once you the emergency room was too late, there was nothing you could do. And you and, and I think it's just like basically symbol, symbolizes every how every healthcare worker feels in New York City when they feel irrelevant and inconsequential when they try to warn the rest of the country what was going to happen. Right. And the rest of the country says, nope, we're going to keep open. We're not going to believe in masks. And New York City actually, ironically, was even though it was ground zero, became the safest large city in America for the rest of the year after April, after its lockdown. Yeah. Um, we were so traumatized. We, you know, a lot of us wore face coverage. A lot of us believed in the virus, and we just watched in horror as the rest of the country went in wave a second, third, fourth, fifth wave, and lock California into the third lockdown. And it's you know, and we were like, seriously, like we died. We have we have friends and family that died, and we warned every three thousand, thirty thousand of us died. And we warned all in a month, you know, or in two months. Yeah, and that's all the ones we know of. Uh, we had to we had to ration care. In yeah. the United States of America in the year 2020. That's and we crazy. all of you. And then to see the rest of the country from April to December to holiday season to not even last month, to see the rest of the country not care what happened in New York. What do you think? How do you think healthcare workers feel in New York when they went through the worst of it and not realized that none of their efforts really made a difference? And, you know, and we, made, we were made to feel inconsequential and irrelevant. So, yeah. of course. Well, my grandmother went to the emergency room, even though I told him not to, and then he dies. Yeah, you think a lot of that happens a lot where people just freak out and they run to the emergency room. Is that do you see that happening a lot? I mean, it's not that I freak out when in the emergency room. It's that the emergency room was always relied upon as a place to go to when you didn't understand what was going yeah. on. Yeah. And us as emergency room doctors, is, yes, fine, we save lives or you know, feel heal injuries. But really, what I see our purpose is, is to be a guide for you to understand something that you may not fully understand when no one else in your family who is not very true emergencies will be able to guide you through we're there for you i mean every day of my life is everyone else's worst day of their lives happy to do that we signed up for this we have no issues with like anyone coming to the emergency room whether it's the, the smallest of things or the largest thing we're here to guide you obviously you know when there's entitlement and you're impeding in our care of actually sick and dying you know, demanding a work note while I'm trying to do CPR. That has happened. I wow. really work out. I'm like, I'm literally trying to save this guy's life. His heart is stuff. I don't care. I mean, that happened oh during the COVID. God. That's when you start to annoy me and frustrate us and create moral injury and burnout. But right. What happened with COVID was that it was a new disease and we didn't know enough about it. And we knew it was very contagious. And yet people were coming in while feeling good, got a positive diagnosis. So they came to the emergency room while feeling good, even though everyone in the media was telling them, once you get a positive diagnosis, you have something to stay home and call your doctor. You do not need to rush in the emergency room because we didn't have a cure for it. We still don't yeah. have a cure for it. And they were thinking that somehow going to the emergency room would just fix everything because it's been like something that they relied on before a pandemic. Happy to help you. But now in an event of a pandemic, it's like, fine, if it's sunny outside, go outside. But if it's there's tornadoes outside, don't go outside. The action is the same, going outside. But the context is different. Not as a pandemic, there's tornadoes everywhere. Why are you coming in the emergency room when everyone's telling you not to? Spreading it to everyone in the, in the waiting room, asking me what to do when you could have called us. Yeah. You called your doctor. 
Wow. Why are you coming to the emergency room meeting a doctor you never met before who knows nothing about you, only has five to 10 minutes with you, only for you to then give it to everyone in the emergency room. And then I see patients stealing our masks and N95s. Oh, and then I realized why they're really- I, Yes, uh, I so, remember that too. And we, that's why we didn't have a PPE and a lot of us died because of that. And I'm oh. not even thinking words here. I'm not exaggerating. Healthcare workers have died because of people taking our personal- I, Yep, I, I do okay. remember that with the N95s uh, during that time and seeing your stories. Oh my God. Yeah, that's my, that, that was every day of my life for March. Oh, hey, hey you're my, that's, this, this is me just observing. And I, you know, it was happening in every hospital. I'm not blaming anyone, just stating what happened. No, absolutely. No, absolutely. And I think that there is no way to sugarcoat anything. Like that's just what happened. And that's, it is what it is. And you I had a patient that was like, at least we believe in masks. Like, What's that? We had a patient that was like, at least we believe in masks. They like just took a box on them. I couldn't, I was busy with a patient. I couldn't stop them. Oh my God. <laughs> hey, you know, people will more like justify any action. And we judge others by their behaviors and only ourselves by our intentions. Yep. 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 Wow. Well, again, thank you for that and for that and for that courage and that willingness to get up every day in March and help New York City. Seriously, that's just insane. But um, you continued um, throughout the year um, doing things. I'm assuming you'd go in. It wasn't as bad as obviously as March. But then in the end of the year, you did. Um, I don't know how did it work if, you, if it was a volunteer thing or you, you got the, the New Year's Eve ball drop also to go and work there. How did how did that happen? Oh, I get involved. In, it's like Forrest Gump. <laughs> For, I just Forrest Gump. looked into random things and I'm like, oh, OK. And it's not like I wanted, I didn't even know there was a New Year's Eve thing. It's not like I saw, hey, do you want any? No, somebody called me um, and asked me to help. Uh, oh, they, wow. And I could do, or they, they asked me um, to get find my volunteers. I'm involved in New York City Marathon at the finish line, Captain. That's also another story. That was probably by accident. Uh, I, you know, a series of serendipities and uh, acts, like, yeah, really like miss, miss the, what do you call it? Misidentification, misidentity. Yeah. Uh, and accidents led me to become the finish line captain of the New York City Marathon. I thought somebody <laughs> else was somebody else. And he actually was the medical director. And he found out that I had volunteered as like a regular volunteer and then asked me to be a captain. But I thought he was someone else. But that's how we got to talk. I was like, oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were someone else. And he's like, oh, no, no. Like, you look familiar. Your name looks familiar. And I'm like, oh, yeah. I, you know, and then he eventually found out that I was a volunteer. And he's like, I'm the medical director. And then he got me to become the finish line captain. Um, in the New York City Marathon where we like, you know, you know, it was, I did a decent job, I feel. And he kept me on as the year after. Uh, anytime there's a cardiac arrest, I save them, but that's what I do. That's my, wow. I was just my mom. And then, I, you know, he found out I love staffing people. Like I just love, I have a big connection uh, with like the medical world and the non-medical and people who want to do medical. Uh, so, you know, I staff them uh, and, you know, he, wanted to tap me when when the macy's thanksgiving day parade came around for covid they wanted to do a virtual uh, parade but they needed to screen all the people who were in production of the virtual parade uh he needed all these volunteers at the last minute and he called me on my birthday uh asking them to get like 50 volunteers within like 36 hours 48 hours to start screening people for macy's thanksgiving day the macy's thanksgiving day parade and within 48 hours i got 50 medical volunteers wow uh, and then they were impressed enough that they were from to the Times Square Alliance and he called me again. Hey, this time a little more notice. Uh, I had one <laughs> week to get like 50 to 60 volunteers, uh, which I got easily. And then, you know, staff that, and, you know, we had a New Year's Eve ball drop. It is a volunteer work. Uh, volu we actually, I ended up, we actually ended up getting them paid. Oh, okay. So we got them paid. Uh, so no one really had to do this for free. For free. <laughs> I was willing to do it for free, but then I, I got it, you know, checked and I was like, what, what it was, where is it? What is this? <laughs> <laughs> wow. I'm telling you, you, you definitely have a big heart and I admire you very, very much. And I think that, um, Don't what's plan that? I just, what's that? I just, I try not to plan anything. Stay authentic. <laughs> just, put, just put yourself in the right place, the right time. Yep. Yeah. And you know, you have also a lot of good karma. So you always are in these right positions or this right time at the right place at the right time. And it's the good karma that you've been giving out. You, you get back in, you know, so that, um, I, I'm I not the best person. No, I've usually been in high school and college, and whatever. <laughs> I, I, was, I was a rascal. I was a, 
the things my parents would tell you that I was a, a demon, I think, in there. A eyes. demon. <laughs> yeah, I was a rebel. I, I was but you know who wasn't in high I, school and college, you know? So there you go. <laughs> uh, but I mean, uh, yeah, thank you. But we do, well, uh, we do look at trends in travel and one of those things, one of those trends during the summer COVID times uh, was obviously in a little bit now still like staying local, traveling local, uh, which we're trying to uh, incorporate into Discover List app, which I'll tell you at another time, I want to get your thoughts on it. We're working on doing some changes, but um to, to, to be able to cater to the current travel and the current situation that we're in. But um, you did a trip with your friends in an RV and during um, the summer or even a little bit into the fall, there was a trend of uh, getting into an RV and taking a road trip. And so you did that um, uh, cross country, right? And so I wanna hear a little bit about your experience there. How was it? Where did you go? What was your favorite part? Sure, I mean, it was actually a bunch of strangers. Uh, oh wow! Been out for COVID. Yeah, it was, it was, it, um, they never met one another before until the trip. Uh, it was the first part was New York to Seattle in an RV. It was seven of us all meeting for the first time together, traveling together for the first time. Um, I mean, I've traveled individually with some of them before, but they all never met one another. Uh, so they all became friends in that trip, and it was from New York to Seattle over ten days in an RV uh, through all the national parks, and then. A few left and three more joined and it was the five of us down the Pacific Coast Highway from Seattle up through Olympic National Park, loop de loop down to, uh, all the way down to Los Angeles. Um, and then, uh, then uh, it was the five of us, uh, when we, we went back up to San Francisco and took the Amtrak uh, back to New York City via the train only, so no planes. Uh, and that whole thing took about three weeks and uh, they were all screened for COVID beforehand. Um, two negative tests, or I think a few of them even quarantined for 14 days in the middle of nowhere in South Dakota before joining on the trip. Um, so we had that um, extra layers of protection. Plus the RV was hermetically, like pretty much hermetically sealed from the outside world. We always stayed outdoors. We only stayed in the RV and stuff in the RV. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, the Amtrak was also super safe and nearly empty. Uh, and then we all tested negative after the trip. And I think it's been more than five to six months and all of us have been negative for COVID. So I knew it was, uh, we pulled it off right. and it was, you know, it's something that I, I didn't plan on doing ever because I hate traveling domestically. Uh, after a group <laughs> that I did 2014, one of the most difficult trips I've ever done. Uh, obviously I say that in half jest because I'm always willing to like do things I hate because that's a good habit to do. You're challenged. You always fire. challenge yourself. <laughs> yeah, it was during it was during a six month uh, virtual screening of uh, our video of our t my 10 year anniversary trip to Egypt. Um, I did last December where someone on the video uh, uh, virtual screening and Zoom were like, uh, do you mind leading a domestic trip again uh, when rates are lower than August? And I'm like, I'll never do that again. And because I say that, if I'll do anything I'll say I'll never do again, I did it again. Uh, <laughs> I'm a man of my word. I don't flake. That, that I do. I, that I love because I flakiness is just, it's my, ugh. It's <laughs> yeah, for those of you who don't know, I remember my, my travel started because I lost the bet to a girl. Uh, wow. There you go. <laughs> I must have Egypt there. A random stranger 36 hours later. Like, who are you? Wow, that's funny. And so, and, and during that road trip, what was your favorite stop? One of my favorites. Yeah, you know, I, I keep asking you favorites, right? Or no, give, it, give us a highlight of that road trip. I mean, all the national parks were great. You know, when I think the drive approaching Grand Teton through Wyoming, when you first see the Tetons. It's beautiful. Ooh. Yeah. I, uh, was, I, I did good. follow your stories and saw all of that. Yeah. Yeah. You got to play some Aaron Copland in the background. Nice. <laughs> uh, if you're going to break the silence at all. Nobody <laughs> should talk about that. You should just take it all in. But if you must break the silence, play some Aaron Copland. Appalachian Spring is a good one. Uh, and that really fit the mood. Um, yeah. And then uh, obviously all the, the a million burgers we ate, that was not a highlight. But like, I, I remember even saying in orientation, I was like, be prepared this is not New York City. Once we leave, it's going to be burger, 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 burger. Oh, yeah. I was joking. And then we actually, in our, when we show our video, a, re a retrospective video of the trip, I, my, my videographer is putting together, 
24 minutes long. There's an actual burger count. Wow, that's awesome. <laughs> uh, um, I think uh, Jackson, Wyoming was pretty cool to stay in. I said they spent two days longer there than usual. Uh, Glacier National Park was partially closed, oh, yeah. but it, even though it was partially closed, it was beautiful enough. Yeah, wow. The Pacific Coast Highway, uh, that was, I mean, that's the Pacific Coast Highway. That yes, I know about that <laughs> one. <laughs> I think LA, when we arrived in LA, I was shocked how many people wanted to come out and say hi with I, I i can't believe i had a welcoming party people well you're like, famous now calvin no, 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 I'm not you famous. interviewed with lisa ling like i i mean i can't compete with lisa ling yeah. <laughs> lisa a, is a really cool person she's like, i hey, love lisa ling don't get me wrong <laughs> down to earth and genuine and i i, I i'm just just happy she's, to call her friend. she is a she is a trojan she is she went to usc and she, um, uh, uh usc alum as well so i love her i love her no but i'm just saying i can't compete because she she interviewed you too so like i can't compete with lisa ling <laughs> we're all wonderful it's good, good people will draw each other to good people uh yes. she, yeah and yeah la la was because it's like i'm in la who wants to meet up you know outdoors socially distanced or physically distant i think like 17 18 people showed up like all who didn't know one another nice when was this again what what month uh this was august okay yeah so summertime yeah yeah this is when rates were like less than one percent in new york city so everyone was coming from low rate places test the negative and we main low rates and then when we went out it was always outdoors and uh yeah i think it was just i think also surreal i think the la get together after the two weeks traveling right before the train uh, ride was that everyone in LA was going through the, I think their second lockdown so they were still in the middle of yeah that pain and then all of us who had arrived were all from like New York City who had beaten it and you know really remained at one percent up until that time in August so at the time it seemed like New York was was still under one percent and in the clear one LA was going back up again and it was a seat that 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 vibe was just so different. The LA people were like looking at us New Yorkers. We had this like carefreeness, like relief after all the shit we've been through. Yeah. Well, LA was going through it again, a second time. And they were just like, what? They, it didn't say it, but it was like the bottling was like, what is it like living on the other side? Like, what's the other dimension like? And I, we didn't know what to say. Like, I mean, I guess the grass is greener where you water it. Like us New Yorkers really just committed to the lockdown and not fighting it and keep our mask on where like, we just keep hearing about what's happening in the OC or what is it like? the Florida of California where, you know, it's just, it, it's just, you know, you can't half-ass anything or have, do anything half-heartedly in the pandemic. And then the train ride was a, a great highlight. Oh my God, that was so fun. How we long ended did up that take? News. That was five, four days. Uh, San Francisco to Chicago takes about two to three days and Chicago to New York takes about one day wow. uh, on the Amtrak. And it was like, like only 10% of capacity. I made sure my, my group all got private rooms. So we had our own uh, rooms to you know be comfortable in uh separate from everyone else um the common areas were like it was just us and the staff were fully masked we're really like strict on enforcing it uh fun. And, and the train like kind of like, there was a delay in colorado with a boulder ended up on the track so we ended up having a six hour delay in colorado springs and the conductor came to our group and was like you, your group is super fun I heard that one of you is a singer songwriter. Uh, can I borrow a guitar? We found out it was a ukulele, so he couldn't really play it. So he's like, if I give you $400, do you mind buying me an Ibanez or a legit guitar in the town? So we took an Uber to a random guitar store right from the train station, right after it was like, you know, waiting for the boulder to get removed. Bought an Ibanez, Ibanez guitar on the spot. Uh, brought it back to him and we had an outdoor concert in front of the train for about like that is three awesome. hours. I put it on IG live, which then ended up on good news movement, which then ended up on ABC, CBS. News. No way. And then it was like, see, that's what I'm telling you about you becoming famous. See? And I was like, well, no, I just wanted to like, you know, do a public performance and everyone loved it. And then, and then we like, got awesome. my home, MSNBC and, you know, Kenneth Gibson, you know, uh, interviewed us about the whole trip. That um, is awesome. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and and I uh, I did see that on your IG stories too when you guys were waiting for the train. I saw that piece. I didn't see you buying the guitar, but I did see that. Um, that's crazy. The boulder. Wow. Um, <laughs> Make lemonade I, out of lemons. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So I uh, talking about travel and just kind of looking, kind of moving forward. Travel industry. I mean, we were talking about what happened in twenty twenty and. Um, 
how people they they love to travel. They they, they want to get out. And I think even before COVID, we have you know the um the 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 people that have the travel bugs. People like you and myself that we're always on a plane going somewhere. We we get out, you know. But because of COVID, we can't do that. So we've found other safe ways to get out and kind of fill that bug a little bit. And so those ways in 2020 and still a little bit are national parks, anywhere where you can be outside, socially distanced, um, somewhere local that you don't have to get on a plane, things like that. So um, what are your thoughts kind of of the travel industry moving forward? Um, what are you thinking um, kind of how things will happen even when the vaccine rollout is complete? Do you think that the travel industry will ever be like it was pre-COVID times? So I'm, I have to preface with a disclaimer that I'm not going to make predictions uh, because well, everything that you remember, my, we started this podcast with me saying, do not plan. Because yeah. All your expectations will not do. So, you know, don't, don't dream, just folk commit to the present. So I, as a person that commits to that, and my predictions, uh, take it with a grain of salt. Uh, if you're asking for a prediction, I'm happy to oblige. Uh, the second disclaimer is <laughs> sadly in the pandemic so far, uh, all my predictions have come true and, uh, and oh, no. in terms of the rates and the holiday bump season and, you know, when the, you know, it's, you know, it's I, everything that I, I predicted, sat, I always wanted it to not be true because it was always a little more on the pessimistic side, except for the vaccine. I was, I was right that the vaccine would be legit. Uh, and so far it's been pretty legit. Uh, yeah, I've been, I've been seeing, I've been following your, your one hand pushups or <laughs> one arm pushups. I've never been able to do one hand pushups, one arm pushups before, the, like, as many, definitely not that many <laughs> until after the vaccine. So, so maybe the vaccine has some sort of steroid in it. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's like, I really think it's like a superhuman syndrome, serum, <laughs> like Captain America. I, I really, I'm, I'm like, and you think I'm joking, but I've never been able to do 35 one arm pushups That's ever funny. until after the, the morning after the vaccine. Wow. No. Maybe placebo, but hey, you know what? You now know it's not. It is what it is. <laughs> not possible, right? Not not possible. Uh, yeah. No, it's possible with the vaccine. So, uh, and the vaccine, you know, the, it's been two months since I've been fully vaccinated. The two shots of Pfizer, and I feel amazing. My sleep is better. My mood is better. I'm eating salad now. It's great. You don't have, uh, you don't like salad? <laughs> no, before then I was just doing takeout the whole time. All in the vaccine, <laughs> you know, healthy habits. I'm. It's, that's awesome. Um, but yeah, but in terms of the travel industry, I, I have to say that we give them the caveats. If you have, to, you must ask me to predict. I think a lot of people, uh, I just have to look to 9-11. It was one day, 9-11 was one day, and it took about two to three years before it resumed. That's uh, true. And so you have this whole one year. I mean, we already have, can't even talk about the reckoning that happens after one year. The you know, 9-11 commission happened, still still reeling from the after effects of 9-11, you know, 10 years, 12 years, 15 years that's out of true. the fact. Now this whole year of 500,000 dead Americans, uh, you know, it's, there's going to be a reckoning that's going to span for the rest of our lifetimes if you want to compare that to what happened 9-11. 9-11 another... was just the U.S. I mean, this is like the whole world, like well, everyone. I mean, I'll, the only exception is if another pandemic happens uh, next year. Uh, would, you know, so that could happen. Mm, that's not even going uh, <laughs> It's very unlikely. Uh, I think this is, you know, it, you have to consider an abundance of caution. This is just the practice round for the real, like, as infectious as COVID, as asymptomatic spread as COVID, as delayed in terms of the symptoms as COVID, but with the the, the effects of Ebola, that is possible. Um, but not wait, to scare wait, anyone. Wait, I'm like, whoa, 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 what? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm watching it. It's just like, it's it's bad. So just can maintain precautions. But in until then, oh, uh, I have to... Yeah, no, it's it's not looking great right now, uh, the way things are trending. Um, but I hope I'm wrong again. I hope so, so too, because that's very scary. <laughs> if you fail to prepare, prepare to fail. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not saying pre like like act activists going to happen. No, just be pre just be prepared. You know, I, I wear clothes when I go outside in zero degree weathers. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, I didn't ex expect it to be cold. Yeah. Just wear clothes, you know, just be, just be, just have your masks there. Don't throw away your N95s. Don't create more waste, you know. Uh, <laughs> but with the travel industry, I think it's, you know, a lot of people want to stick to domestic travel. Uh, RV sales went up. Uh, and I think that uh, people were reluctant of flying for a little bit. There's going to be a big spike among like, you know, older people who um, you can just get vaccinated uh, and it's going to go out and just reclaim the, you know, the, 
whatever Make they up lost, for, for lost or time. Got out on. Um, and then there's going to be a, a, a bump in like younger people who feel like their youth has been robbed. Um, so definitely a lot more travel to Florida uh, and spring breaker kind of type of travel. Uh, and the people who just never really believed in it, who were just, you know, just keep traveling. The ones who got away with it when never got sick, but also didn't believe in it. There'll be some of those who would just say, see, I told you so. Uh, and a backlash of, you know, against, it was going to be this back and forth. And then, you know, ultimately, um, a lot of countries are going to slowly open up here and there. There's going to be backlash against, I think, Americans uh, abroad who you know, people may feel that, you know, we didn't yeah. you know, perpetuated this or didn't believe in this. Uh, I hope I'm wrong, but I, I'm, that's what I'm, you know, kind of going to expect. Um, and then there's going to be more pod traveling in terms of people sticking together in the groups and not really interacting outside the groups because of fear. I think that's just like been ingrained as habits after one year of dealing with this, this reluctance with strangers, um, interacting with other strangers. Um, so I think there's going to be less like bookings of like hostels or places that with bad, you know, who hasn't enough uh, outdoor kind of things. There's going to be more private rooms kind of bookings, uh, less travel romances and flings because people are kind of just worried about catching or bring something. Are you vaccinated? Now you really don't. It's kind of like, you know, what happened yeah. before with STIs and, you know, the HIV AIDS mm -hmm. crisis. It's going to be a, a bump uh, after like the free love movement of the 60s. It's, I mean, humans always work in cycles. So, and then there's going to be, you know, it's going to be the roaring 20s. Like right after the 1980s Spanish flu, there was the roaring 20s. Gonna be, yep. Right after mm -hmm. everyone's kind of adjusted, after, you know, getting up and dusting their knees off after falling down, it's going to be like mm -hmm. the more 20s. Yeah, the, it's no holds barrel, free love, going crazy. You know, the, the, the pandemic is truly gone and there's going to be like, everything's going to be fully booked and, you know, overwhelmed yeah. and, you know, lots of resources used to accommodate all that, you know, demand. Um, I really do think that people are going to just, the ones that weren't travelers are going to become travelers because of that. They're like, now yeah. I can get out, live yeah. the life every moment, like if it were your last. Yep. And uh, I mean, I'm telling a lot of, again, messages. It's like, you, you know, I've always had told people who flaked on my trips that like, you never know when you get hit by a car tomorrow or plague might happen, yes. if you no longer travel or you get diagnosed God yes. forbid, with cancer uh the next day after all that studying you know that you pulled off this trip or you have kids and you can't travel anymore people now message me during the pandemic it's like how did you know that a pandemic was going to happen and i like on the year that i was planning to travel i was like you should have went with me in 2018 2017 26 all the times you could have yep. went the, yeah. all of 2028 i'm like thank god i took that trip thank god i traveled this much and just the what was it november 2019 i did four countries in South America. And I was like, I barely, you know, just didn't miss that. And I'm like, thank God I did that at that time. And thank God I went everywhere else. I went there before the pandemic because all of 2020 couldn't move, <laughs> couldn't move from these four no. walls. How I was able to deal with it during the lockdown was my memories, you know, yeah. and I thank God I travel blocked everything. Yeah. There's not a single day in my life of travel. I didn't blog about it, which is in, on, in public, uh, yeah. that I can reread it. And it's just this fascinating feeling where I could relive my travels through the, my writings and yeah. the photos I've taken. And sometimes it was so surreal where I would read it in the middle of the night going through something because I heal through travel. If I can't travel, I'm not heal as quickly. I mean, reading about it is better than nothing. It's like taking a Tylenol when I really need the cure. Right. Um, but right. You know, I was reading the blog post and then there were some moments where I'm like, oh my God, this is so cool. Who is this? And I realized that this is me in this like delirium that I was in at the middle of the night. I mean, it sounds a little narcissistic. Uh, I'm very self-aware no. of it, but <laughs> it, it was the only thing I was getting it for. It was just like- But you're not the only one. That's happened to all of us. I mean, I, I was the same way. Like I was looking through all my travel photos, like, oh, that that day, I remember that trip, I, you know? It's like, we yeah. we felt like, oh, we were, we were in this, this like it was the end of the world it felt like that like the end of times you know because of this the situation we're in we don't know what it is and so we're looking at what our life has been we look at like the travels we've taken and so no you're not the only one i think that happened to a lot of people you know yeah i mean yeah and, yeah, and what, it, it, it's out of body experience yes absolutely and that's why uh, one thing actually that I uh, people were telling me that they do love about Discoverless because not everybody has a blog, so they can't look at all their travels. But on Discoverless, you can log your travels, so you're able to see every country you visited. And so, um, if, if people feel like it's a little bit of like a travel journal almost, so uh, people were looking at at, at Discoverless and what they were the travels that they had taken in the past. So 
you know, it was, it was good to, for that because no one was using it because no one was traveling, <laughs> but at least they were using it to look at their previous travel memories. But yeah, like I mentioned, we're looking at making some changes um, to kind of cater to the traveler of this time because of the pandemic. So more on that and um, would love to hear your thoughts about it, about that when it's all said and done. <sighs> but yeah, but anyways, it was so good to speak with you. It's always a pleasure to chat with you. I, um, I can't wait to this thing to go away and I can come to New York City and, and uh, meet up with all my friends because I left in March. Yeah, in March. And I uh, couldn't say goodbye to anyone. Couldn't have the uh, goodbye party that I had. I thought I would have when the day I left New York City for good. Didn't have anything. So I want to go back and, and have it. <laughs> oh, New York is still here. It's right in the sun outside. It's still, the, I think, the safest place in America. Uh, because it's, it's this little, it's like the little things that count. Nothing bigger than that. Yeah. New York is, will still believe in it. Uh, and we're all getting super vaccinated. Like, you know, there's a huge demand. We're treating it like a supreme brand where like now everyone feels like they're missing out if they're not vaccinated, which is, I guess, a good blessing in disguise when the supply runs out, there's a greater demand. And when the supply comes through, people start getting signed up for it. And before you know it, the iron, it's always the irony. That yep, makes. that is true. Yeah. Yep. Well, thank you very much. This was lots of fun. And we sure hope this is this pandemic is over so we can all travel. I think that's one of the things that we want to do the most when this is over. Yes. Um, and so to all our listeners, Discover List is always looking to engage with you as a traveler. So if you would like to be a guest on our podcast or have any questions you'd like for me to answer, please contact me at I want to travel at discoverlist.com. That's I want to travel at discoverlist.com. Or you can also chat with us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and of course, the Discover List app. So thank you so much again, Calvin. And I can't wait to speak with you again and, and definitely can't wait to see you again. So please take care and I will see you then. See you here. We'll see you soon. All In right. Person. Travel together. Yes, soon. for sure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you.